great, great to see those of you who are with us in person today. And if you happen to be uh, traveling or you're, you're home, maybe not feeling your best, glad to have you with us streaming online. And welcome to those who are with us on television too. Uh, this is about the fifth week, I believe, in this sermon series, Where Jesus Walked. Some of you may recall that the reason we're doing this particular series at this particular time is that we have a group of people from uh, OCC, about 39 uh, folks total, who will be traveling to the Holy Land this summer, and they will literally walk where Jesus walked, and they actually leave this coming Tuesday, the 14th. So I wanted just to ask you as a church, if you would, to be uh, in prayer for them, that they have safe travels, that they are uh, healthy and strong while they're there. It looks like it's actually going to be hotter. <laughs> it might be hotter here than it is in Israel, if you can believe it, uh, when they go, but that they have a wonderful time, and that most importantly, that they have a, a life-changing experience. So um, would you, if you remember this week, be praying for them. They'll get back on June 20, 25th. We want that really to be a, a changing event. Speaking of life-changing experiences, uh, the Kenworthy household was in for a surprise when on Wednesday, our son, who was supposed to be still a month out, was born. So he was born on Wednesday. Um, it was a big surprise for us. There's a picture here on the screen. Uh, that's uh, Joel Lewis Kenworthy. I'll talk about that name in just a, a moment, but... Yeah, Sarah went in for a regular appointment on Tuesday and called me and said she wasn't coming back home and end up, uh, end up happening on, on Wednesday morning. Mommy and, and baby are healthy, doing well. Uh, older brother is adjusting still <laughs> a little bit. I think that might be the longest road here. And then I'm still trying to figure everything out. Uh, I told the Saturday night crew that I took my second shower since Tuesday right before the Saturday service. I think I got my second shower in. I didn't even have time to shave for that service. I shaved for you this morning, so consider yourself uh, special, but I don't know what might come out of my mouth today, so please forgive me in advance. Sleep has been harder to come by, and I, I want to take just a moment and talk about you know, the name not only of Joel, but then also of Ezra, my oldest, because it fits into what we're going to be talking about today. My oldest son's name is Ezra Thomas Kenworthy, uh, the son we just had, Joel Lewis Kenworthy, Ezra and Joel, of course, are books in the Bible, part of the Old Testament. Uh, they're both names of biblical books. Ezra was an Old Testament priest, a priest of God's people. He was a teacher of God's word. And at a really critical juncture in Israel's history, he taught the word of God in such a way to turn the people's hearts back to him. And so uh, Ezra has significant uh, meaning for me and my life and what I feel called to do. But the Hebrew of Ezra means helper. And that is very significant to my wife, Sarah, because she, she loves service as a gift of her. She loves to serve. She loves to help other people. She doesn't care if she gets any of the limelight. And so um, we really love that name because it, it, it meant something to both of us. His middle name, Thomas, Ezra Thomas, is after my father, who's a, a wonderful man. And then Joel, the name Joel means the Lord is God, which is a, a wonderful affirmation. The Lord is God. We'll talk about that some today. Uh, it was actually the first Christian sermon in Acts used a passage from Joel as the main text, so that's kind of interesting. And then the name Lewis um, is named after, middle name after Lewis Johnson, who a lot of you will know was a longtime fixture in the Owensboro community, uh, was a lawyer, involved in a lot of different nonprofit agencies and things, and he was an elder of OCC. And when Sarah and I were struggling to get pregnant for years, Lewis and his wife Suzanne faithfully prayed um, that we would uh, be able to have children one day. And so I was able to tell him we were pregnant with our firstborn just before he passed away from cancer. And uh, we did name Ezra after my father, but we wanted to make Joel's middle name after Lewis Johnson, so we're thankful for him. So those, the meaning of their names. And I, I share that because research suggests uh, that the name we receive does help shape to some extent the person we become. And there's debate about how much the, our name plays an influence, but most most research suggests there, there is something about what we are given and what we're called throughout our life that's going to um, shape us to a degree. Of course, a large part of what shapes our life comes from our genetics, what we receive from our, our parents. Some of it comes from the Lord. We, we, we tell Ezra he's got a little bit of mommy, a little bit of daddy, and then whatever else the Lord has sprinkled in. Um, then you have things like influences of, of friends and Teachers and parental figures, grandparents, entertainment that we choose, education, culture, the decisions that we make, all, all these factors meld together to shape us into who we are. And today we're going to look at a passage of scripture that speaks to what shapes us most of all. So of all the factors that 
um, determine who we are or help set the course of who we become, this factor, if we will recognize and respond to it, shapes us more than anything else. So you could call it the factor of all factors or the force of all forces, but it's, it's the most important thing that we will answer in our life, what we talk about today. And so if you have a Bible, just like Jody said, we're in Matthew chapter 16. So if you've got a Bible or a Bible app, Matthew chapter 16 is where we're going to be uh, for the entirety of this sermon. I'll bounce to a few other places. We'll put all the scripture on screen. But I want to invite you to stand with me as we read Matthew 16. Out of respect of God's word, we stand. We want to receive what God has for us today. And we're going to be looking at verses 13 through 20. Starting in Matthew 16, verse 13, says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, and we'll talk about that in a moment, where that was, what it was about, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, verse 16, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. It's the word of the Lord, amen? You may have a, a seat. The account we just read, this story, and I, sometimes I'll use the word story, it's, it's a true story, this narrative in the Bible, focuses on the question, who do you say the Son of Man is? And Jesus poses this question to his 12 disciples, and when he does, they tell him, even back then, people got a lot of different ideas about you, Jesus. Some people say you're John the Baptist, others Elijah, Jeremiah, a different prophet. And Jesus says, okay, well enough, well enough. He makes it personal. He says, who do you say that I am? He turns the question to them. Before we get to the answer that they give, specifically the answer Peter gives, I want to examine the the location where this account took place, because as we noted, we're in this series called Where Jesus Walked, and we're looking at the life of Jesus and his call upon our life through the locations where he, he traveled and taught and healed and ultimately would give his life. And what, what we're seeing each week is that what we read here in the Bible, the, the meaning for our life today is very much shaped by the location where the story unfolded. Like we can see things in the text from the physical location where it happened. Some of the meaning it has for us today comes from the location where it took place. In today's passage, occurs in an area called Caesarea Philippi. Now, like each of the other narratives, we're going to see today how our understanding of Caesarea Philippi helps show us the significance of the message for our lives in 2022. Now, Philippi sits at the base of a mountain, Mount Hermon. It's over 9,000 feet tall. It's the tallest mountain in all of Israel. Uh, Just one look at the picture, with the snow-capped tops, and you have a much better understanding of why Psalm 133 in the Bible says this, this is Psalm 133, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. I'm gonna hang that in my house now that we have brothers in the house. When brothers dwell in unity, that that will stop all fighting, I'm sure. Um, How good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It's like the precious oil on the head, running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like, get this, the dew of Hermon, the mountain which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. It's talking here about the blessing of God, the refreshment that God brings, and it uses the mountain as uh, an analogy. Mount Hermon is the source of the Jordan River, which is a significant waterway in much of Israel's history. Uh, It finds its origin in the melting snow of Hermon. That snow also um, provides for the river, but it gives dew for the valley. It gives dew for the desert. It brings refreshment, just like the psalm says. This is part of what mountains do. They, they impact weather patterns, and they, they form waterways. And that's partly why places of high altitude, they, they possess almost this mystical or magical quality. You, you see it in literature. You've probably read a, a fiction story at some point where a mountain played some significant a part in the story it had uh, magical qualities, like the Lord of the Rings series has several different mountains that play an important role. You see something similar, not just in, in literature, but if you study world religions. 
and if you study uh, spirituality, because in ancient pagan thought, the higher something was, the holier it was. And even today, as you go higher in elevation, you will often find increased interest in spirituality and in spiritual things. I'll give you one example. I remember interviewing with the church before we came to Owensboro. We were figuring out what was next in our life, and we interviewed at a church in Longmont, Colorado, which is near, very near Boulder, Colorado. It's about 30 miles north of Denver. Uh, honestly, just outside of Estes Park. So if you've ever been to Estes Park or seen pictures there, beautiful uh, area and location. We, we drove around and got to look at it all, decided uh, as beautiful as Estes Park is, it just does not compare to the Ohio River. <laughs> and so, so we wound up in Owensboro um, after all, but we, 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 love, we love Colorado, a beautiful area, but n not a high percentage of population of Christians, at least in the area that we were near the University of Colorado in Boulder. There are a lot of Christians there, but not a high percentage of the, the population. Great interest, though, in spirituality. As I talked with the, the leaders at that church, they would talk about how you know, our community isn't necessarily um, favorable to the gospel and Jesus, but they're very interested in spiritual things. And as I asked them about why that was, they said, well, you know what? It's the same dynamic that you see in the Bible. Again, that the, the higher that you travel, the higher that you go in elevation, your heart is drawn to something beyond itself. And so as you look through the Old Testament, you will find often that when God's people went astray and they worshiped um, someone other than the God of the Bible, Scripture often tells us that it happened at the quote-unquote high places. Have you ever seen this before in the Bible, that their hearts went astray in the high places? They built an altar of worship to a foreign God at, at the high places. It's just this... Um, insight that when they would go into these mountainous areas, they would often build idol, idols, they would offer sacrifices. Dan was a place where this happened a lot. It was, it was close to Mount Hermon as well. There's just something about the majesty and power of a, of a mountain range or of an ocean that elicits worship. And as you stand there in the presence of that space, you will either worship the creator for what he has done, the God of the scriptures, or you will be drawn to worship something else. They, they just elicit that in our hearts. So Caesarea Philippi sat at the base of this tallest mountain in Israel, Mount Hermon. It's where the worship of other gods, other than the God of the Bible, took place. And honestly, it's one of the darker locations that you can find in terms of just interest in darker spirituality that you'll find anywhere in, in Israel. When you, when you enter into the area, which in the olden days was called uh, Benias, it was later changed to, to Philippi, you're met by this huge rock face that enters into this foreboding cave. And it was believed in ancient times that that cave was the gate to the underworld. And so it was called the gates of hell, or the gates of Hades. And we, we read that in Matthew chapter 16. We'll see it again in a little bit. Um, it was believed that that's where the Greek god Pan lived. And so as you came in, this is the, the entrance to the cave that was called the, the Gate of Hell. Uh, after Alexander the Great's men conquered the region, they built temples and sanctuaries to Pan. You'll see some of them in these pictures here. Uh, if you've never heard of the god Pan, he's supposedly half man and half goat. And you can easily imagine that if you worship a creature that's supposed to have been half man and half goat, uh, that worship often involves some unsavory rituals. So there, was, there were often different types of animal sacrifice involved. Uh, there were at times acts of bestiality that were involved in this worship. Um, it's not all surprising. It came to be known as the gate of hell, which Jesus references here. And next to Pan, there are several other temples to Zeus and to other gods. And this is where Jesus asked his disciples who they believed him to be. Of all the places Jesus could have thrown down this gauntlet and said, well, who do people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Jesus chose to do it here. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. This is a long way from Galilee, which was Jesus' home base of ministry with these 12 gentlemen. I've told you in most of these um, sermons that a lot of the locations we're looking at are just a couple miles from one another. So when Jesus healed people in Capernaum, it was just a mile or two from where he preached the Sermon on the Mount. The, the, the distance is not very Big. All of Israel, I believe I heard once, was about the size of New Jersey. So there, there's not a long way to travel, even if you look at all the different locations. But this location is about 26 miles from Galilee. So Jesus has intentionally took his guys on, on a field trip. 
This is a place where most Jews did not have reason to go. A lot of rabbis would forbid good Jews from going there. And of all places, it's at the gates of hell that Jesus says, who do people say that I am? And then he gets real personal. Who is it that you say that I am? And, and from that context, I want us to take a step back and I want to consider this passage from where we sit in 2022. And like I told you, I just had a, we just had a baby, so my mind is a little fuzzy, and I hope I make sense here. I'm going to try to cover a lot in a short period of space. But a lot of historians have noted that we're in the midst of what um, they call this cultural convulsion. That's the phrase that is often a cultural convulsion. Everything seems a bit unstable. Things seem to be changing rapidly. It might seem recent to us. We'd go, oh, there's a whole lot of change happening in the last 10 years, in the last five years, in the last two years. But... It really traces back, they'll say, as far as to even the 1960s, when we had emerged from World War II, uh, life had, had begun to normalize in some ways, but also if you lived through the 60s, you know that it was a time of intense change to daily life and intense ways of the way people thought. Um, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you were a, if you, a child of the 60s or you went to high school in that time, but if you were, you'll know that there was intense change taking place. And historians will say that real revolution and real change doesn't happen in 10-year increments. So we talk about the 60s or the 70s or the 80s, or I grew up middle school, high school, largely in the 90s, which was the best decade of all those decades, by the way, the 90s, um, and the best music of all those decades, too. But um, I think someone, someone may have booed me for a second with the music. But we talk about those as if they're individual decades that are almost disconnected, but it's, it's all part of a bigger story. When people look back at, at our time frame 100 years from now, they're not going to talk about it in five-year increments or 10-year increments like we do who are living through it. They're going to see it as the 60- or 70-year period where this great cultural convulsion takes place. If you think about it in terms of, of, of Christian faith things, the Reformation that was led by Martin Luther and others, as they were going through the Reformation, they didn't think about it the way we think about it now, looking back. They just knew things were changing. And you probably sense right now that the world is experiencing changes right as we speak. Some of them good, some of them maybe not so good. We can put our finger on parts of what's happening, but not all of it. When people do look back at our time period, though, they're going to talk about this big chunk of time where technology led to the end of one war, created the possibility of a cold war, gave us computers in every home, then gave us phones that have computers that we carry in our pocket. This led to increased globalization. It led to ideological revolution. And, and all of this is more complex than I'm letting on here in the moment. But Bob Dylan saw it all the way back in 64 when he said, the times they are a changing. He noticed something different was taking place, and that, that change has continued all the way now into 2022. Just a decade before Bob Dylan said the times they are changing, C.S. Lewis had written that Jesus is either Lord, liar, or lunatic. Anyone remember reading this? Mere Christianity, he spent a good deal of time talking about Jesus is Lord, liar, or lunatic, but he can't be two of these things. He either is the Son of God and he's Lord, he lied about who he was, or he was just a crazy man, and he didn't know what he was talking about. And the aim of Lewis's argument is that people would come to make a firm decision about who Jesus is, just like Peter does in Matthew 16. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are Lord. This is what Peter and Lewis believed. But while Lewis' argument is, is logically sound, it doesn't hold the weight it once did. You can say to someone, Jesus is either Lord, liar, or lunatic, but most people today, including many people within the church, would tell you, no, you can have your cake and eat it too. Like, you can have the best of both worlds. You'll find people very easily, again, inside and outside the church, who would say, hey, I think Jesus is great, and I really like what he said about love, but I don't buy what he said about sex. I love what Jesus said about peace, but I don't like what he said about the anger that goes within my own heart and how I contribute to the unrest of this world. And we could come up with a lot of different examples like this. Just like Caesarea Philippi, our world today is a place where people worship whatever it is they feel like worshiping. And we have a sense of right and wrong. Like people, it may not be the same sense of right and wrong, but almost everyone lives with some sense of right and wrong, um, some sense of virtue, of justice, but they don't always have this accompanying sense of God's place within it all. And so what happens is we, we, we try to live 
with all of these values, with all of these good things, but we, we forget the source of life that allows this to be possible. So what happens is we say things like, we, we want the values of the Christian faith, but we want it without Christ. Or we talk about human rights, but we, don't, we do it without talking about the dignity of human beings. We want eternal worth, but we've given up on eternity. This, this is what I mean by we, we, ha- we want to have our cake and eat it too. And the result is we, we frequently have this disconnect in our hearts and in our lives and in our worship and discipleship. And so this question, who do you say Jesus is, is as important today as it's ever been. And you can try to kick the can down the road and not come to an honest answer of who you believe Jesus is, but all that's gonna happen is it's gonna lead you to frustration. It's gonna lead to confusion. It's gonna make you wonder why, you know, you're you're coming to church, but life isn't quite seeming to make sense still, or you're very frustrated with God and what he's he's doing. If, If Jesus rose from the dead, then you must embrace what he said. If he rose from the dead, you have to embrace what he taught. If you reject Jesus' words, can you really embrace his cross? So is, is Jesus a prophet? Is he a teacher? Is he a myth? Or is Peter answered, Simon, verse 16, Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by, by my Father in heaven, And I tell you that you were Peter. So he points out the name change that Jesus had given him. Peter means rock. And on this rock, I will build my church. Now that's that's not setting Peter up to be the first pope, but it's saying on this rock, the confession, the rock of the confession that Peter makes. And Peter played a huge role in the church. On this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. What I want you to notice is that in confessing who Jesus is, Jesus now tells Peter who he is. So Peter says, you're you're the promised one of of God. You're the Messiah. Simon says that. And Jesus replies, okay, Simon, that's good. It's good that you know from now on, no longer Simon, Peter. Peter, the rock. Once Peter sees Jesus clearly, Jesus says, okay, great. Now we can get somewhere with you. Let let me me help chart out your God-given Identity, And here's what we learn from this brief exchange between the two of them, Jesus and Peter. You won't be clear on your identity until you're clear on his. You won't be clear on your own identity until you're clear on Jesus's identity. You won't be clear on your place in the world until you're clear on Jesus's place in the world. Now, what do the scriptures tell us about what happens when we come into connection with Jesus? 2 Corinthians 5 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. So something transformative takes place when we recognize Jesus for who he is. We're a new creation. Romans 6 says, or don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So again, something new takes place in us. We're buried with Christ We're risen to a new life. We're a new person. Ephesians 2 talks about it this at some length. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He calls us there God's workmanship. Like the word is poem in the Greek language. Like God God is putting us together in a way through Christ 
to live out our God-given identity. And the truth is we all have some experience of a disconnect between the identity we, f- we feel or experience and the identity that we're given in Jesus. We, we can become tied to our physical appearance as if how we look determines who we are. We can get tied into our, our work performance. We can get tied into our performance at school, our possessions, our family, our political affiliation, our sexuality, as if, as if that were the most important thing about who we are. We think that thing makes us who we are. It gives us worth, purpose, community. But God, he keeps bringing us back to the gospel. And he keeps bringing us back, reminding us of our identity in Christ. We just read three passages about it. Like More than anything else, they're telling us that whose I am will determine who I am. If I... If I recognize Jesus as Lord, if I belong to him, that informs everything about who I'm becoming and what I do and how I live and how I treat other people. Like, who do you say Jesus is? You need to be clear on this. If he's Lord, everything else will start to fall into place. Not always neatly, not always easily, but everything else begins to fall into place. So questions like, how do I live out a healthy sexual identity? It's determined by your identity in Christ. My identity in Christ, my allegiance to Christ, helps direct my my sexuality. How do I order my life's responsibilities, like my career? Well, it's determined by the work of Christ. Your value isn't tied up into your own work and your own performance. Your value is tied up into the work Jesus has done for you. How do I think about contemporary politics and live as a good citizen of a community and a country? By embracing the kingdom of God. We want to be informed. We want to vote. We have values and things that we believe and would, would follow, but we do not blindly embrace any modern political party or person and think like they're, they're God's answer to the ills of this world. God sent his answer. And Jesus came to establish an entirely different form of kingdom. How do I deal with the anger I feel over what's been done to me in the past? How do I feel with the, about the shame? What do I do with the shame that I feel over what I've done to other people? Well, that might be part of your story, but how you deal with it depends upon what you believe about the justice and grace of God. Right? Who do you say that Jesus is? Again, you're not going to have clarity on who you are until you're clear on who Christ is. Like We could go around the room today. We could talk about things that make us who we are. I'm a 41-year-old male husband, uh, father now of two, Ugh, uh, father of two, pastor, Midwesterner, I've grown up in the Midwest my whole life, you know, wannabe athlete, but not good any longer, introvert, you know, who likes spicy food and likes a good cup of coffee. You, you can take all these things and even, you know, more private things that I'm not sharing with you today, but all of that has to fall in line with my allegiance to Jesus, all right? How I'm a husband, how I'm a father, how I'm a a man, a citizen, how I'm a neighbor, how I handle social media. Like, if Jesus challenges me on any of those things through his word, I need to be willing to adjust because, again, he's Lord of my life. Who do you say that I am? Standing in the shadow of the gates of hell, a region rife with with compromise to the spirit of the age, to the emperor, to false gods and fatal desires, Jesus chose to ask that question. Who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, Peter, that changes everything. If you need clarity in your life, I would encourage you to first get clear about who Jesus is. If you need strength, draw from the strength of Jesus. If you need grace, Jesus offers it. If you need peace, he provides. If you need to know who you are, you go, I don't even know who I am anymore. I don't even know what I was created for. Recognize, recognize who Jesus is, all right? Get the most important thing in order, the most important thing that can be said about us, and all of everything else begins to fall into place. Who do you say that I am? You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Let's pray together. God, we... We thank you for this brief exchange between Jesus and Peter in the Gospel of Matthew, and we thank you, Lord, that you uh, never give up on us, never forsake us, but you sent your son so that we could be in relationship with you, our creator. And God, I look around this room, and I think about people who are with us online or on television, and there are so many different things that make us who we are. 
no two of us here are exactly the same. You've created us all. But Lord, for each of us, the same is true, that what we say and believe about Jesus is the most important thing that can be said about us because it's gonna dictate everything else in our life. And so Lord, I pray that we would live with a sense of awareness of who Jesus is. And Lord, as we worship him as Lord and follow him as Lord, and as we lean into his grace, may it change everything else that could be said about us. And that people look at us and know that we are following Christ because of how we live in all these different areas of our life. And may you receive the glory for that. May we experience greater joy and peace even in hard times. And God, would you make your way known more and more in this world, even when it sometimes feels like we're, we're standing at the gates of hell. I pray, God, that the way of Jesus would win. We pray these things, trusting in Christ and all God's people said, amen.